Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next in our series of TRSP webinars and our final webinar for 2024. I'm Julia Lapham. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and the clinical director of the New South Wales Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis. And I'm also an associate professor at, the, at UNSW Discipline of Psychiatry and Mental Health. I have over 20 years um, experience working clinically and in research with people living with psychosis. And I uh, have developed this webinar series as a means of sharing clinically relevant research uh, for people working with people who live with psychosis. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country and of lived experience. I acknowledge the strength and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are the traditional custodians of the diverse countries from which we join this meeting. I'm privileged to be calling from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. I also acknowledge people with lived experience of mental ill health and recovery and the experience of people who have been carers, families or supporters. So welcome to the Mind Gardens TRSP seminar series. The TRSP is a New South Wales health funded statewide service hosted by South East Sydney Local Health District. And we're grateful to South East Sydney Local Health District, New South Wales Health, and the Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network for their ongoing support of TRSP. I will begin with a little bit of housekeeping before introducing our speaker for today. So uh, we will have a question and answer session as always at the end of the webinar, and you can write your question in the Q&A, but not speaker be seen. There will be a simple anonymous poll towards the end of the webinar, Please complete it so that we know how worthwhile the event is and also because we're asking you today for themes that you would like to be covered in subsequent webinars, which will be run by Mind Gardens in 2025 and onwards. We also appreciate your feedback by email and you can write to us about topics that you would welcome at future webinars and with questions for our speaker today. This event is recorded and we will distribute a link to the event video within two weeks to those who have provided us with an email address. So I'll move now to introduce our speaker. It's my great pleasure uh, to have with us today, Professor Carol Harvey. Carol is an honorary professor in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Melbourne. She was formerly a consultant psychiatrist in the Northwest Area Mental Health Service in Northern Health, Melbourne. Carol has been involved in research, policy work, and professional and service development concerning psychosocial, psychosocial approaches to prevention, treatment, and recovery from mental illness. She is treasurer of the board of the Australian branch of the World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation, and is on the bi-national committee of the RANZCP section of social, cultural and rehabilitation psychiatry. Carol's going to talk today about a topic that she really has pioneered work in over many years in Australia, family inclusion and family work in psychosis. Over to you, Carol. Thank you so much, Julia, for that welcome to country and acknowledgement of lived experience and for welcoming me and introducing me. And I'm delighted to be here because this is a topic very close to my heart. So I'm ha very happy to share some thoughts, ideas and research. And we're going from research into practice during the course of my 40 minutes or so. Now here you'll see a number of names. These are some of my collaborators and co-authors. Um, and I thank them hugely for working with me and in particular Jenny Berger and Dr Margaret Leggett who are important carer advocates and carer consultant colleagues who participated in this research and some of the thinking. Now I'm going to talk about family situations and needs and the overall significance of caring. I'm going to touch upon the extent to which family needs are addressed in typical mental health service provision 
We'll think about the evidence for family inclusion and family work, including family psychoeducation as a particular model. And I'll briefly mention some examples of successful family work approaches within Australia. In terms of the evidence into practice part, we'll be um, thinking about a stepped approach to working with families that could be useful for you and talking through briefly some implementation issues. When I talk about family and carers, I'm talking about family members, partners or de facto uh, of people who are living with severe mental illness, maybe their friends and or other significant people who provide them care, help, support or assistance. And that can be both emotional or practical. And um, the context in which I'm speaking is public, clinical and community-based mental health services for adults and a little bit of work that um, I am involved have been involved in and am familiar with in terms of young people uh, living with severe mental illness. So my own research has concerned people living with psychotic illnesses and their families and significant others. And I'm going to be drawing upon some of the uh, data from the National Survey of Psychosis and our work in implementing and evaluating two family psychoeducation programs. Now, I often return to the WHO International Classification of Functioning, and I hope you agree with me too, that as rehabilitation practitioners and thinkers, it's a very useful model for us because it, rem it really captures in a very um, brief way the kind of work that we do in supporting consumers to improve their activities such as cooking and also their participation in life, whether that be as parents or employees and so forth. But also this model is so important because it reminds us that context is important and in terms of context, we need to be thinking about families as context for the consumers that we work with. So this is why I particularly like this model. So some people have said to me in the past, well, people with severe mental illness, their families aren't involved. They're not living with them. Well, I have to say there's evidence to the contrary. So firstly, from the National Survey of Psychosis conducted across Australia, and I'll touch upon this in, in other uh, material that I'm going to speak with you about, most people living with psychotic disorders had frequent face-to-face -face contact with their family members in the previous year. So they weren't always living with them, but they certainly had contact. So the data tells us that 56.5% had almost daily contact, so more than half, and almost one in five had at least weekly contact with their families. And I would class this as frequent contact. And so there is a relationship ongoing between the consumers and family members that needs to be considered and supported. Also, there's, there's plenty of broad literature, and I've just cited one, such example here that suggests that if we involve family carers in treatment through appropriate interventions and programs, they can positively contribute to consumer recovery. So it's in our interest to think about families in that regard. So for example, uh, Ellie Fossey and myself, we did a qualitative metasynthesis of the literature from the consumer viewpoints around their seeking and maintaining employment. So it was employment focused literature and it was um, seeking consumers views on what was helpful for sustaining jobs or dealing with work issues or helping them with job seeking. And they emphasize a diversity of su supports were helpful, but in amongst that qualitative literature, there were many references to how families can support them in this area of employment. So given the roles just from those two pieces of evidence of families and their involvement, we need to keep them in mind and work um, productively, with, productively with them, I would um, suggest. 
Now I'm going to refer to some work that Abner Poon did um, for his doctoral thesis when he was working with me in Melbourne, and many of you will know him as an Associate Professor of Social Work at UNSW, a very um, important colleague, so, and also some work that Laura Hayes did for her doctor, doctoral thesis, and I'll explain a bit more about these various studies shortly. Just to put you in the picture around the Nas National Survey of Psychosis, which I will be coming back to repeatedly, conducted in 2010 across Australia. So there were um, seven catchment sites across five states and territories, as you can see here, indicated by the red dots. The coverage was adults between the ages of 18 and 64 years. And those catchment sites that were selected were equivalent to 10% of the adult Australian population. The coverage in terms of our ascertainment of people who um, would be invited for interview was treatment services, which included public specialised mental health services and NGOs or community managed services who are funded to support people with mental illness. So in our screening process, we um, screened almost 8,000 people who were positive on the screener for psychosis. And within that group, almost 2,000 were randomly sampled for in-depth interview. We had an interview response rate of 44%, uh, but there were no systematic selection biases within that. So Abner conducted a parallel study of carers within the National Survey. So his parallel study uh, identified and interviewed 98 carers, mostly relatives, and they were providing support to those consumers within the national survey in the two Victorian sites. They've been caring on average for seven years. And what he was uh, first able to demonstrate was that they were more isolated and they had a poorer quality of life than the rest of the population. And two in five of those carers experienced probable depression or anxiety, according to the K-10. So significant needs were identified in his study. Now turning to Laura's work, within the context of our implementation of a family psychoeducation program in a clinical service, Laura collected some baseline data from the carers who entered that program. And you can see here some of that data. So this is data um, derived from the friendship scale, which is a scale that is very useful because it has population norms. So what you see here, the green line represents the population norms on the friendship scale for the wider community. And you can see on the right hand side, nearly 60% of the Australian community feel very connected to friends and supports, whereas roughly half of our carers, indicated by the red line, um, report this level of connection. And if you look to the left of this graph, where we see the isolation demonstrated, the carers indicated by the red line were more likely to feel social isolation compared to the general community. And relatively few people in the general community report um, feeling very isolated or isolated. So yeah, a total of 7%, whereas um, our carers, there were more than a quarter that reported that. So there are significant differences between carers and the community on this measure. Well, we might say, given those needs, well, perhaps they're addressed in routine service delivery. And that's an important question to ask ourselves. Well, are they addressed in routine service delivery? Well, within Abner's study, he did a longitudinal follow-up study of those 98 carers over the course of a year. And what he showed was there were no significant changes for any of the carer's health and well-being variables that he assessed after one year, with the exception that the carers had a poorer perception of their quality of life in relation to physical health. Perhaps not surprising, given they were a year older, but no improvements were demonstrated. In terms of the lack of improvement, this rather suggests to my mind that carers' needs are largely unaddressed by routine mental health service provision. 
Importantly for us within the rehab sector, carers were more distressed, isolated, and experienced more grief in relation to their consumer's illness if they perceived their consumer relative to have difficulties with functioning, according to the LSP20. So really what that is telling us, to my mind, is that the consumer group that we work with within mental health rehabilitation are likely to have carers who are even more distressed than the typical carer in mental health services. He also, Abner also conducted semi-structured interviews at baseline and at follow-up, and he wanted to assess changes in carers' perceived needs, and we used a routine outcome measure from the UK, the carers and users' expectations of services. What this showed, rather similarly to the previous um, slide, was minimal improvement in carers' perceived needs over time. So the only improvements detected after one year were that carers reported they'd received some help and had fewer needs in relation to information about care workers and dealing with risk or safety issues. And whilst those two things are very positive, I think it's also a bit sad because it perhaps indicates in our typical service provision, which by the way was, these were community mental health teams, um, indicates the narrow focus of work that often happens with carers. He did a thematic analysis and the carers, amongst the five themes identified, the carers reported that they had a variety of needs for their own biopsychosocial support. And they also recognized um, the need for and their desire for well-being and independence interventions for their consumer relatives. Again, really, the carers were recognizing the need for the kinds of work that we all do and believe in. So in summary, for that first part, three in every five consumers living with psychosis have frequent contact with their family. Whilst we all know and acknowledge that these relationships can be mutually supportive and rewarding, they can also have a negative impact on carer health and well-being. I think those data that I've already shared with you suggest that family needs are poorly met within routine service delivery. We can't just hope that if we work productively and effectively with the consumer, the families will benefit. The family them themselves recognize the need for rehabilitation interventions for the consumer, and they would likely benefit themselves from this, but also need, as I suggested, their own intentional support and assistance to get a full range of benefit for themselves. So I think, and I hope that I've already encouraged and persuaded you to believe that addressing family needs can benefit both the family and the consumer. And I'll go on to develop that point a little further now. Before I do that, I just want to share with you, and I'll come back to this again later, a stepped model of how to include and involve families that um, myself and other, others of my collaborators, especially at the Bouverie Centre here in Victoria, have developed over the years, based on some work um, in from 2006 from Matagibor and colleagues. So this is um, something that's been evolving and that we've contributed our own thoughts to. So I've um, indicated three levels here. Level one skills are more basic skills. And from our point of view, these are the kind of skills that every clinician in a team or a service should actually have under their belt. So things, um, we should all be working in a family friendly service culture and that in itself is important. We can't just be family friendly practitioners. We should have enough skills to run a family meeting we should have a service and a team that engages early on with families in the consumer's treatment. It's no good one year into the consumer's treatment saying, oh, we've got this fantastic family work program for you and they haven't heard from you before. We should be good at providing information to families at the outset and we should be able to assess um, family needs in a, in a straightforward way. 
So those are skills we would argue all clinicians should have. Now, level two and level three skills, they're more complex skills. They require um, more in-depth training and probably in the context of our service provision, not all clinicians can expect to be trained and supported to gain these skills, but each team or service ought to think about who within their sphere can be trained and supported to um, offer these interventions. So at level two, two, we're talking about brief interventions. So there are various examples of that. I would include something like single session family consultation at that level, and we'll come back to that later. Also, there are things out there in the community managed sector, family to family education programs or peer to peer, they're referred to as well, which is typically where um, family members, carer consultants might run groups for other family members. Um, so that's at level two. And at the top of the pyramid is level three skills, family psychoeducation, which I'll speak about shortly. The other implication of this pyramid, as you go up and get to the pointy end, fewer families require these more sophisticated and specialized things. But most families, if not all families, need the things that sit at level one. So the next um, section that I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about family psychoeducation is two of my articles where there's a lot of this material as well as a lot of the references to other people's work because there's a huge body of work that's built over the years. It's not all down to me and my colleagues here. There's um, been some great efforts around the world. Okay, so let's recap the evidence on family psychoeducation. Now, family psychoeducation is an umbrella term. Uh, so this psychoeducation takes various forms and there are a number of examples of programs or interventions or treatments. Two that you might be familiar with are multifamily groups and behavioral family therapy, but there are various others. What they all have in common though, is that they provide information, support, and some skills training to all family members, including the consumers. It's not just the family members on their own. So the family is worked with as a whole. The skills are universally applicable skills, in fact, they're useful for us all. And often it's actually retraining rather than training because people had these skills, but the advent of the illness might have got in the way of uh, the family utilizing these skills to best effect with each other. Now, the evidence is strong around consumers living with schizophrenia for family ed psychoeducation benefits, but actually there is also literature around any mental health condition where relapses are likely, that these sorts of programs for families are beneficial for consumer and family. Because what they do is essentially address the link between the stress that the family experiences around the uh, illness and its effects, how this undermines communication and problem solving within the family, and how those two things lead to an increased likelihood of relapse experienced by the consumer. So they all have these elements in common. What is the strength of the evidence? Well, Mind-bogglingly, there have been more than 50 RCTs since the 1970s. So you might ask yourself the question, why is this not routinely available around the world and across Australia? What these RCTs have shown is reduced relapse and admission rates for the consumer. So the reduction in percentage terms is around 20 to 50%, depending on the trials. Another way to express this evidence is that for every seven families that are treated, one relapse of a relative living with schizophrenia is prevented during the course of a year. So this is also known as the number needed to treat. So seven families for one relapse to be prevented and the confidence intervals are between six and eight families. So this is solid evidence. And the effect sizes are similar to antipsychotic medication. And there are other benefits because there are psychosocial outcomes that have been shown in these trials where they have been assessed as outcomes, 
including better social connections for the consumer and improved employment prospects. This is particularly where the programmes incorporate an element that is focused on employment or social connections. Now, the added benefit of these approaches is that they have an additional benefit for the family member. So not just the consumer benefit, but the family members also benefit. So where this has been assessed, and not all the trials do assess the um, impact on family members' outcomes, it's been shown that family members experience less psychological distress, reduced burden, and improved relationships are reported within the family and improved family functioning. What do these models look like? Well, what they have in common, amongst other things, is involving the person with severe mental illness in the approach. There's always an element of information sharing, and this is information about the disorder, early warning signs, and relapse prevention. And typically, a, a sophisticated relapse prevention plan is developed between the clinicians, consumer, and family. There's a behavioural orientation to most of the approaches, and what they're aiming to do is teach coping skills. The stance of the clinicians and service should be that the families are partners in this approach. It, we're not experts providing information or teaching, we're working in partnership. Although they're structured approaches, they're pretty flexible. They can be adapted to the individual family culture, and they can also accommodate things like crises in the approach. And they address social as well as clinical needs. So all those elements are in common, regardless of model. An example, just to dig a little bit deeper, behavioral fa family therapy is an example. This is an approach where um, the work is with an individual family, not multiple families in the room. So assessments of conducted of each family member individually and their goals are identified. The family is assessed in one session and that is to discover how they solve problems and achieve goals together. And you would typically ask them to identify an issue for discussion or a problem and ask them to work on it in the room so that you can learn how they go about it. Once that assessment phase is completed, the information sharing is typically the early um, component of, of the work, although you ask the family what they want to work on first and go with that, but uh, they often want information sharing. And within that, the whole idea is to position the person with schizophrenia as the expert, as much as we are experts in a different way through our training and background, but the person with schizophrenia as expert from the lived experience perspective. So it's very important to work with that um, approach within the room. And some, sometimes it's a revelation for the family to hear the person encouraged to speak about some of their symptoms or experiences. Communication skills are typically worked on. So here are the four communication skills that can be worked on with the family members. So expressing pleasant feelings, making a positive request. So this is about assertive language to make a constructive request for behavior change. Active listening, which is a very neglected communication skill and is often very important for these families. And one that's quite difficult for all of us, and it is indeed difficult for these families, is expressing unpleasant or difficult feelings. So the aim there is to encourage that those difficult feelings are expressed, but alongside that, the person tries to um, make some efforts to resolve the issue, which could, for example, involve making a positive request. So there's some um, aim of working towards a solution. The other approach that is often used is problem solving, which can also, as you'd probably be very familiar with it, um, turned into goal setting if there isn't a problem identified, but there's a shared goal. And that's the typical six step method in that approach, ranging from identifying the problem clearly, um, brainstorming, 
identifying pros and cons of each solution that's generated in the brainstorm, choosing one or more solutions that are helpful um, in the family's um, way of thinking, and then getting uh, encouraging the family and supporting the family to have a plan of implementation for their solutions and to practice what they've devised in between sessions and report back on their progress. So that's a, a quick course tour of what um, happens in behavioral family therapy with a typical family. Just coming back to this issue of why aren't these things widely available? So within the National Survey of Psychosis, we were able to ask the consumers who were interviewed whether they received certain psychosocial interventions through some indirect questions and some more direct questions around these topics. So in a broad sense, when we have a look at the second row, and in a broad sense, when we asked them whether they'd, they'd participated in some family work, just a, a little more than one in 10 answered in the affirmative. But then we apply, applied some more filters from other questions that we had in the national survey, which really narrowed that down to whether it really was an evidence-based approach to working with families in, uh, based on the type of evidence I've just um, shared with you. So that's in the second two columns. So you can see then that drops the number of two, uh, just over 3% of consumers reporting they've received an evidence-based form of family involvement. In the final two columns, we applied an eligibility filter because not all consumers would be eligible or need this work, especially those consumers who say, I have no family or I have absolutely no contact with my family, it wouldn't be appropriate to offer it. But that doesn't make an awful lot of difference. We've still got less than 4% of consumers overall in the National Survey of Psychosis reporting that they receive something resembling family psychoeducation in the past year. So that's not as impressive as it should be, I would argue. What do we see when we turn our attention to clinical practice guidelines or treatment guidelines in terms of the state of the evidence? Well, the RANZCP, clinical practice guidelines, make a recommendation family psychoeducation is effective and should be offered routinely in the comprehensive care of schizophrenia, which is pretty straightforward. The NICE guidelines from the UK, and they're the guidelines for psychosis and schizophrenia in adult, adults in general. So they recommend to us that we should be offering family interventions to all families of people with psychosis or schizophrenia who live with or are in close contact with the service user. And hence my emphasis earlier on on uh, the data in relation to frequent contact, because all those families with the frequent contact with the consumer would be eligible and could benefit from these approaches. The last bullet point is about the um, guidelines that we should be extremely interested in. They're also from NICE. They're quite recent, 2020, and they're really our sole example of rehabilitation guidelines. And so they're guidelines for rehabilit rehabilitation for adults with complex psychosis. So very much the consumer group that we're all particularly interested in. And those guidelines suggest we should continue to offer people with complex, complex psychosis, individual CBT and family intervention as recommended by the NICE guideline on psychosis and schizophrenia in that adults, that's the one I previously spoke about. It's a strong recommendation with very low to moderate quality of evidence. So the evidence isn't as robust as they would like. NICE does um, give us quite a high threshold for that evaluation, but there are also problems in um, doing this kind of research as you can probably already appreciate. It's hard to do large scale RCTs. It's um, a lot of the studies are quasi experimental designs. There are different types of models. Um, the outcomes vary according to um, what is researched and so on. Typical kind of issues that bedevil psychosocial research. So I think that's some of the reasons why that statement for very low to moderate quality of evidence. 
10 minutes, Julia. Exactly. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I like this systematic review by Fiona Logan and colleagues in the UK. She gathered together all the randomized control trials of interventions for people, relatives, for people with psychosis, but which reported outcomes for their relatives, because outcomes for relatives are not always reported. The first thing to notice is virtually all the interventions were more, effect, were more effective than less effective. So in the majority of studies, they were effective. If you scan your eyes down the columns, interestingly, the only one that wasn't reported as effective in the majority of studies was emotional support. Now, I take that to mean not that we don't give emotional support to relatives, but that in and of itself, it isn't sufficient to assist them. The second thing to notice is these will all be highly familiar to you as rehabilitation practitioners and rehabilitation experts and researchers. Things like setting realistic expectations are absolute bread and butter for us in rehabilitation. So in a way, I would argue you have a head start in terms of doing family work when you look at this data. So it's very helpful for us in that respect. And the other thing is, yes, these, th these things are within the trials benefiting consumers, but this is showing a dual benefit that um, is also worthwhile for the families. Now, some work I did with colleagues here in Australia and Helen Claspie in the UK, we did a systematic review and narrative synthesis, the World Psychiatry published a couple of years ago. And what we were looking at was community-based social interventions for people with severe mental illness. We identified 11 papers, which were assessing family interventions. They were a variety of methodologies, but there were three RCTs and amongst the four quantitative studies. There were varied interventions. They all included psychoeducational elements and a number included cognitive behavioral strategies as we might have expected. And some of the findings that we reported, carers showed significantly reduced caregiver burden compared with the control group in three RCTs of high to moderate quality. In the qualitative studies, they were um, showing potential improvements in social inclusion for all of the participants, whether consumer or family member. And in this re more recent literature, there's a trend for peer workers to be involved as co-facilitators of the family intervention, which I think is a really positive trend. So what we concluded was family interventions facilitate better social connections and relationships, improve functioning, and reduce care burden. Abner's work, um, after his doctorate, we were involved in um, a program of introducing single session family consultation in four headspace centers funded out of national headspace. And this was a program of implementation over one year and we evaluated it. We found it to be very acceptable to the young people and their families in that 39.5% was the rate of declining the invitation, which I think is pretty good for this kind of uh, work. The workers reported increased confidence and familiarity with working with families at the follow-up point. And there was also demonstrated improved organizational support, such as um, supervision and mentoring being provided for staff in this uh, type of work support from co-workers to include families and policies and protocols have been changed to support the work. What this um, piece of work led to was that National Headspace concluded they needed to do a national rollout. So single session family consultation was rolled out to at least 70 Headspace centers in my last contact with them. So um, this type of working with people, which is at level two on that pyramid, is widely available for young people, at least, through Headspace. And one of the challenges in introducing this kind of approach is that uh, the workers there are often youth worker um, in terms of their background and have an individualistic approach and worry that working with families is going to negatively impact their uh, working alliance with the young person. But you can see here, in terms of satisfaction ratings, and the maximum possible was six. We had high satisfaction ratings across the domains we inquired about. 
and young people and their relatives were virtually indistinguishable in that sense. So we didn't have the young people having um, poor satisfaction in this regard. The family to family education groups, um, Wellways Australia have been running them and Jessica Stevens and colleagues did a pre-post evaluation. I think the important point to make from their evaluation was not only were family participants less likely to have worry, report tension and distress, but carers of people with a psychotic disorder involved in their program experienced significantly greater reductions in worrying than did the other carers. So a demonstration that even things like family to family education groups, which you might wonder whether they can really make a big difference to carers of people living with this severe mental illness, they do make a difference. And in fact, they can benefit more than other carers. Gail Bradley and colleagues have run multi-family groups in the west of Melbourne and, and researched and um, reported those. Some important points here, they reported reduced relapse and improved vocational outcomes for the consumers involved. And their groups involved English and Vietnamese speaking families living with schizophrenia. Now, just going back to the family psychoeducation evidence, the evidence is cross-cultural. So the RCTs occur in Australia, Canada, China, Scandinavia, Spain, UK, USA. So widely applicable. But this is about um, migrant families and cultural differences within a country. The point I want to make here is that they can be applicable to Vietnamese speaking or and other migrant communities within Australia, but the research tells us that there needs to be some cultural adaptation to accommodate their cultural needs and differences. Um, we also implemented and researched, evaluated a behavioral family therapy program, that's level three family psychoeducation within the community based sector. So in collaboration with Mind Australia, these were consumers who weren't receiving case management from their local CMHT, um, but they had equivalent severity of illness and similar diagnoses. And you can see here the benefits in terms of their quality of life, the basis 32, which is largely a symptom measure, and the FAD, which is a family um, functioning tool. Then looking at the, those Carers in that same program, Freya Coker's master's work. So these are the carers' reports of their needs according to the cues, uh, which is the measure I mentioned earlier, where carers report whether they want more help or support or information in a particular domain. The blue triangles are pre that behavioral ther family therapy program, the green circles are post, and you can see that there's benefits reported by those carers in a number of domains. Importantly, things like their relationship with the consumer and how they use their own time, so social areas. And the benefits um, were not seen in relation to finances, unsurprisingly, because the program wasn't offering financial support and support from services, unsurprisingly, because these people were not in clinical services. Okay, the final piece, Hopefully I've got five minutes left, Julia, to talk about how do we do these things, the implementation. Absolutely. If you ever had any doubt that the system matters, here's five data points from our behavioural family therapy implementation in the clinical space in community mental health teams. And what we plotted was mean caseload against mean number of family contacts per week as reported in the statewide database. And there's a high correlation for only five data points, rather suggesting that as the caseload gets higher, the contact with family decreases. So we have to know and acknowledge there are systems issues. And in terms of implementation, you can't just say, this is wonderful, Let's go and train our staff and it'll all be hunky-dory because it won't. So how do we think about this? Yes, of course, we need training. 
but we have to reform our staff and service system context to best support the work. Early engagement of families is essential, as I've mentioned, um, because if you want to step them up the tiered approach, because they have a high level of needs, you've got to start with those basic engagement skills and being a family friendly service. You've got to redesign your service delivery so that you've got the possibility of a stepped or tiered approach to including families. As mentioned, the level three skills, are they're higher level skills, so you can't and won't train all your clinicians and not all families need that kind of work anyway. Or ask for it, they might need it, but they might not recognize their need and want that work at the time that it's offered. Offer it again though, later. At levels two and three, the work is more skilled, it takes more time. For example, a typical behavioral family therapy course of treatment is 10 to 12 sessions. So what is required is a small specialist subgroup group of clinicians who have sufficient time to do this work separate from other duties. They need ring fence time from their ordinary duties that have enough opportunity to practice the intervention so as to gain their confidence and skill in the work. They're provided with regular supervision and mentoring, and they have regular opportunities for co-working with an experienced therapist or co-working across teams with each other. If there's only one person trained in a team and another person trained in another team, then the service needs to allow the possibility of those two people working together with a family from either team. Back to that pyramid, just to remind you how it looks, because I've talked across that pyramid. I've talked a bit about level one skills. The brief family intervention sit at level two, that's things like single session family consultation, the family psychoeducation at the top. And finally, well, what have we learned over the years about how we can bridge that evidence practice gap? At the staff or team level, people needing improved knowledge and skills undoubtedly, but we've got to have the right attitudes. And I have still encountered in dark corners of the service, people who still hold the attitude that families are just problematic and you should leave them well alone or it's too difficult or frightening to work with them. Managers in successful programs have tailored training and team leaders and anyone, even I would advocate policy makers, People who can make a difference to this happening but don't directly do the work still need to understand what their role is in supporting work. We've talked about supervision, co-working, dedicated time for those practitioners. Communities of practice like this one that we're involved in are super important. In terms of the people who can facilitate this work, peer workers are also crucial and I think they will play an increasing role in co-facilitation. Probably you need sub teams of different staff, each trained in different psychosocial interventions. This is just one of them, of course. So you can't expect all staff to be trained in all psychosocial interventions. And you need things in place to encourage the work like suitable KPIs. So we're even monitoring whether we're doing the work and change your position descriptions. And finally, in conclusion, families are important as social context for most consumers who could benefit from rehabilitation. They are potential partners for us. They have their own needs. They should be specifically and intentionally addressed. And that includes effective rehabilitation for the consumer, but is not limited to that. Addressing family needs and at least some of the consumer's needs for rehabilitation can both be achieved through family involvement for which there is robust evidence. And there's evidence for successful implementation of family programs in Australia but there is a failure of systematic implementation and scaling up of the evidence. But there are some useful strategies that myself and others have learned over the years. So thank you for listening. There are some references here and I'll hand back to Julia. To thank talk you very about much, practice community and your service. Thank you, Carol. That was an absolutely wonderful summary of the importance of family work. And I'm very grateful to you for the talk and also for the magnificent contribution that you've made to this very important field over many years of working. So thank you. I would like to take a moment just to encourage
people in the audience to please start typing away your questions in the Q&A for Carol. Meantime, I'm going to um, share a few contact details with you. Any clinicians in the room or family members who are keen to hear more or refer a person to our service, this is the email contact. And Sarah, if we could just move through to the next slide. Here's our information for staying in touch with Mind Gardens, who uh, will continue to host the webinars next year. We'll stop screen sharing just now so that we can move to the gallery to answer some of the questions which are already coming through quick and fast in the chat. Carol, uh, I'll start with uh, Natalie Cutler's question. Carol, is there, I, I mean, there's, there's been some talk for some time about repeating the very important SHIP survey. Have you got any updates on that? Not recently. There was a little bit of activity two or three years ago from the federal government um, in connection with WA, which was the lead um, university, but I haven't heard anything since, and which is a bit disappointing because it's been a rich mine of data, as you can see. Okay. Um, and uh, Arani asks, what is relapse prevention training, Carol? So you'd be most familiar with that component of family psychoeducation programs. What I would say is when clinicians in CMHTs often do this work, they don't always involve the family or they, they do it separately with the family and consumer, but it's most effective with the consumer and family together in the room and getting as many of the family to contribute because sometimes there's a key sibling, for example, that doesn't, it isn't the identified next of kin, but they've got a huge amount to contribute. So I think you'll be familiar with the, the way that you can devise these plans, but it's more the process of devising them that is crucial in behavioural family therapy. And in involving families in that work, which is about recognising signs of early signs of relapse, sort of a, a relapse signature, recognising what those are and being able to identify them and seek help appropriately. And, and family members may have their own insights, things that they notice. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, the family psychoeducation programs typically have helpful sheets that can prompt consumer and family around um, what they might discuss as um, and identify as the relapse signature, which you can then record and the potential um, actions that consumer and family and clinicians take as partners. So that's the other piece of it. Lovely. Natalie has another question for us. Uh, has there been any study focused on carers' experiences in the mental health inpatient setting? Well, um, one thing I can talk about immediately is the Meriden Family Programme in the UK, which has had a long history of implementing behavioural family therapy. Um, and they start the work in the acute setting and they've trained some of their acute staff and their managers. The challenge with the acute setting, of course, is as it's longer term work, um, it can't continue in the acute setting, but you can actually set your service up to identify relevant consumers and families and start the work. Um, in terms of the overall care experience in the acute setting, that's not something that I'm particularly familiar with in a broad sense, but um, I don't I don't think it's all, it's certainly not always positive. Um, and certainly there's a need for more information sharing with those families of people who are receiving acute care. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that in acute care and with the crises that the people are going through, the families can only take in so much. So you've got to tailor what you do to their situation. And then once the crisis has died down, they can move into these other modes of family inclusion. Thanks, Carol. So Annika asks, what would the main two or three articles be that you would recommend for people interested in this topic to engage with, to really sort of reinforce this information? I wonder, Carol, if that's one that we could maybe ask you to provide 
after the event. I mean, of course, you're welcome if you can off the top of your head uh, respond to it now, but we could certainly collate and share those resources for people and send them out in yeah. the email that follows the webinar. Do you have any initial thoughts? Yes, well, I no, there's there's quite a few. Um, but we did a viewpoint in the local journal, the ANZJP. Yes. Um, I refer to that, and that's in my reference list. So that can be a starting point. Of course, work has happened since then. Um, so I'll, because it's not all gathered together, I'll think about what's a good go-to yeah. for the last and, 10 and years. Maybe for, maybe for clinicians, a bit of a how-to, you know, that would be helpful okay. too. Yeah. Also in my reference list is my article in Advances in Psychiatry, which is yes. out of the UK um, Royal College Journal. And that is very much geared towards CPD and clinicians. So it's a, it's an overview of these approaches, family needs, and a little bit about how you do the work without it being a full-on training. So those two would be good starting point. They'd be and good I think starting I'm a third that is more <laughs> Okay, thanks, Carol. Um, is there any evidence for family intervention reducing presentations or admissions in borderline personality disorder that's slightly beyond the scope of today but do you do you know carol i think there's a, a few rcts actually and someone like mcfarlane in the us will have written about that in one of his reviews so if you look for i think his first name was robert wasn't it julia or oh, is yeah, let's let's see if we can find that for that for that um and for that sure, participant. He's, he's the one who's gathered the evidence about other conditions. Yes, Eric that's Trump. right. And Huang says, "Thank you, Prof Harvey, for your talk. It was very informative and a useful topic. Some patients who have severe psychosis can be paranoid towards their family and refuse family involvement. How would you address and approach that issue? You did touch on this in the talk, but how would you broach that with the family member and the patient, the individual? The first thing is come back to it. You don't have to ask just once. So you may have a situation that's changed three months down the track. The way I often start is to say, you are having contact with your family. They are key people in your network or you're living with them even. So doesn't it make sense to involve them so that they can support you to the best, in the best way possible and to the best extent? And if we don't involve them, then you're not going to um, experience that benefit. So I talk about that, that involvement and how working with everyone can really multiply the benefits for all concerned and talk about how in you know from the paranoid patient's point of view sometimes the family aren't doing helpful things and vice versa and so from their perspective you can talk about well they may i hear you saying there are unhelpful ways that your your family are going about things we've got an opportunity to identify and talk about those things and address them yes yeah yeah, and as you say, Carol, you don't need to just broach this once. It's something that you can return to. We've got time for one last quick question. I'll uh, go to Samantha Littles. Just wondering how family psychoeducation is recommended to be delivered to just family and carers. Are there benefits in providing psychoeducation with versus without the consumer? The thing I can say about that is, of course, you heard it involves typically 10 to 12 sessions. That's a big ask for both the family, the consumer, and us as clinicians or service providers. There is a need and there is growing research into briefer interventions. Now it seems that the interventions that maybe can be completed in six or seven sessions, those are typically done with just the family. So look into the briefer intervention literature for just working with families. So although I emphasize the involvement of consumers and I found it hugely beneficial to all concerned it's it's not a one size fits all and it's not that way and no other way you know we have to be flexible we have to um respond to need wonderful carol thank you again for a wonderful talk and thanks for all your work on on this important topic 
And I'll say cheerio to you and to everyone in the audience. Thanks for joining today. Bye. No Thank you, everyone. Bye.